Welcome to the Nerd Stalgic Podcast with your host, the Ginger Off the coast of the volcanic island of Santorini, the intrepid archaeologist Lara Croft makes the unexpected discovery of a glowing golden orb able to guide its holder to the mystical Pandora's box. As the legendary artifact contains ancient mysteries of unfathomable power, Lara needs to make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands, especially the former Nobel Prize winner and now a bioweapons dealer, Jonathan Rees. With the aid of the former agent, Terry Sheerden, the fearless adventurer travels the world in pursuit of the precious item. However, can she retrieve it in time to save the day? Lara Croft Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, 2003. Howdy beans, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Nerd Stagia Podcast. I'm your host, Luke the Human. Hope you're doing well, hope you're all good, as per usual. As you heard in that wonderful introduction done by yours truly. Today we're going to be looking at Lara Croft Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life from 2003. But before we get into today's topic, I just want to do a bit of housekeeping because I like to keep my house nice and clean. So make sure that you follow me on Twitter at nerdstagic underscore pod to be kept up to date on everything and anything that I am doing. Also, if you listen to this on YouTube, don't forget to leave a like, comment and a subscribe. Preferably a like and a comment. They help uh, absolutely immensely uh, because the way that YouTube works is that it's all down to engagement so the more that you engage in a video the more that it gets shown to people and then the more people subscribe and all that jazz so if you could do that I'd be absolutely grateful also if you listen to this on Spotify and you haven't done so yet please rate the podcast out of one to five stars you can do it on your phone it's really really quick and it'll help me out greatly again like YouTube on Spotify the more ratings that you get the higher you get seen and that the more people see it and you know the more I can do here for you guys so if you could do all those things for me right at the beginning before we get into today's topic I will be incredibly incredibly grateful now if you've done it let's get on with the topic so as I mentioned I'm going to be talking about Lara Croft today uh, the cradle of life the second movie with Angelina Jolie um, I do want to say that before we begin I have got a bit of a cold so if I sound a bit uh, mucusy or a bit sniffly I do uh, apologize hopefully it will pass by the time I get around to actually watching the movie and reviewing it but for this introduction you stuck with a blocked nose Luke so I do apologize for that but I'm really really excited um if you have or haven't listened to my review of Tomb Raider, the first movie of Angelina Jolie, please go back and check that out. It's on Spotify, it's on YouTube. Check it out, give it a listen. It'll bring you up to date on what I'm doing here today. Um, but this film, I'll be honest, I don't have much in the way of memories of it. Unlike the first movie where I've seen it multiple times, I've got it on DVD. Uh, it's one of those that I always come back to and I enjoy. And it's my greatest memory of Lara Croft. And it's probably my first proper introduction to the character of Lara Croft, as well as seeing my dad playing uh, Lara Croft on his PC when I was very, very little. Um Unlike all those things with this movie, I don't actually have that many memories. I don't remember this movie very much. I haven't seen it as much as, as I'd seen the first film. So I don't really have a, a, a lot to say in terms of the uh, memories, really. All I really remember about this movie was that Jared Butler's in it and that there's a moment where he's in, like, I think, a Serbian prison or some sort of snowy prison somewhere and he's doing uh, push-ups um, and pull-ups and Lara Croft comes in with like I think a big white coat and that and then I remember something to do with base jumping and I remember dirt bikes on Great Wall of China I think and then a at the very end monsters attacking loads of people in a in like a pit um which sounds like I remember a lot of the movie but that it's just vague memories and I don't know if I'm making that stuff up or if it's like this is actual scenes from this film I don't know I'll see when I get around to actually doing the review but the point is I'm trying to make is the fact of I haven't seen this film as much as I've seen the other Lara Croft I've actually most likely I've probably seen the newer Tomb Raider movie with Alicia Vikander more than I've seen this film 
you know, which is a shocker because um, even though that movie's great, because uh, this film is older, you would assume that I'd seen this one more, but I haven't. I've probably seen it probably twice. Um, probably, if if I think about it, maybe once full length, second time I missed it halfway when it was on TV. Um, but I'm interested because, not just because it's Lara Croft and that's the whole point of what we're doing here today, but also the fact of I don't have any real member berries. I can't have any rose tinted glasses. I can't sit here and say, oh, it's the best movie ever because I, I generally don't remember it. Um, and I don't know if it's because it, that if it was good or if it was bad or if it was because it just wasn't on TV as much or it didn't do as very well. I generally don't know. So I'm excited to see what this movie's like. Does it hold up? Is it better than the first one? Is there a reason why I don't remember it? Or is there a reason why people don't really talk about the second movie very much? You know, so all of that and more is hopefully what we're going to try to explore today um, with this movie review. So we'll go straight into the cast. So of course, we've got Angelina Jolie back as the wonderful, gorgeous uh, Lara Croft. Uh, we've got Jared Butler playing Terry Sheardon, Chris Barry playing Hillary. Um, I can never pronounce this guy's name whenever I try to pronounce it. Siren, Siren Hindus as Jonathan Reese, um, Noah Taylor as Bryce, uh, Jimon Hudson as Kosa, uh, Till Swingler as Sean, Simon Yam as Cho Lei, um, Terence Yin as Zhao, and Daniel Kaluro as Nicholas Pakari. Um, so that is a cast for today as the for, for the production i couldn't find a lot on the production to be honest um not as much as the first movie um but we'll, we'll see what we can do so the budget for this film was 95 million dollars less than the first film's 115 million um, dollar budget um, filming lasted for three three and a half months which included six days shooting on location in hong kong um santorini lynn Gualnet in North Wales. If I butchered that last name, I do apologise. Um, Dublin for mainland China. China, In a two-week stint in Kenya for shooting at Ambosili and Hell's Gate. And the remainder of the picture filmed on sound stages in the United Kingdom. Uh, one scene in the film was set in Shanghai, but it was shot on a set and not on location. The film also featured the new 2003 Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. The film scene when Lara parachutes into the moving vehicle in Africa and takes over the wheel from Corsa as part of the Jeep's advertising campaign. It was specifically custom for the film by Jeep's design team, along with the film's production designers, with three copies constructed for filming. 1001 limited-run Tomb Raider models were produced, available only in silver like the film version, and minus its special customizations, and put on the market to coincide with the release of the film. Jeep's vice principal, Jeff Bell, explained... The ad campaign is more than just a product placement. The Jeep Wrangler Rubicon is the most capable Jeep ever built. So the heroic and extreme environment in which Lara Croft uses her custom Wrangler Rubicon in Tomb Raider is accurate. In the end, Lara's Rubicon has less than two total minutes of screen time in the finished film. The reason I added that in, because I just thought it was funny, that they went on this whole much to customise it and make sure that a big advertising campaign and it was only in there for two minutes. You know, but then sometimes you get ads that are just in there for like a few seconds. So two minutes is a long time when you think of an ad in a movie. Um, director Jean Boyt hated working on the movie and he quotes, It was not such a great experience, but more than the reason has how the studio tried to really interfere with it in a way. And the thing itself is that the makers of the game were also involved and they never told me that they also have a say in the story suddenly there were all these changes that have been taken and which had to be what and what cast and then suddenly it became such a big scene eventually was a big deal um end quote um he had this to say uh, about working with angelina jolie he said i kind of like working with her and she's a character but i thought she was a very interesting character to work with she's definitely very opinionated but not in a negative way i feel she was difficult to work with, but for me, it was probably not a problem. I didn't really see anything negative at the time, and I really ended up liking her very much. So, end quote. Um, that's really it for the production of it. Um, one thing that I do remember from when I was doing my research into the first movie, though, was the fact of I, I mentioned at the end of the production that um, one of the bigger sort of critiques was Angelina Jolie playing the character, and one of the reasons why uh, people were so against um, Angelina Jolie playing 
uh, Lara Croft was because you know she, she didn't have she wasn't English and because she didn't really have the look of Lara and also of course we went into the details about her having the right breast size and all this stupid sort of macho man stupid stuff but I remember reading in that that for the second movie um, because the first one did so well so Angelina had a lot more say in the role in the character and she decided to basically make Lara a lot more curvier and voluptuous in the movie because she is naturally anyway and also she had to have um padding in in the bra to kind of make her breasts a bit bigger and obviously for this movie she was like no i'm not having the padding i'm having my natural size and you're just gonna have to deal with it um which i think is absolutely fantastic fair play to her for standing on the ground and be like no i'm gonna play the cat you've asked me to play the role i'm gonna play it as best as i can as me as myself i'm not gonna have the padding and the first movie did fantastic so i'm you know, she has a lot. She had a, probably had a lot more say um, in the movie. I'm trying to find the exact quote here, but um, no. Do, 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 do. Um, when yeah, so Jelly said she's not that flat chested. She's a double. She's a D. So we could tuck her down some. Oh, I can't find it now. Oh, I can't find the same. But basically, the quote was under the lines of "Yeah, we just decided to." Um, for the next movie to basically make Lara more sort of authentic, really a lot more authentic to not just the character, but a lot authentic to Jolie and to make her more curvy and more sort of like, this is what a strong, powerful woman looks like. This is what a natural woman looks like, you know? And um, I wish I could find that quote, but I, I can't, but yeah, so I'm excited. I am interested to see what this movie is like. Like I said, I don't really remember it much. Um, so it might be good. It might be bad. It might be, neither or, or, or everything really we'll see so that is the introduction done i'm gonna go off now and watch the movie fingers crossed it's good if it's not i'll let you know um and i'll be back in a minute right so i've just finished watching lara croft uh, the cradle of life and honestly it's really good it's incredible um it takes what the first movie did and improves upon it tenfold. You have a lot more Lara Croft in this one, a lot more action. She actually feels more like the the, the character, really. Not that um, she didn't in the first movie. It's just the fact of you just get so much more of her, so much more action. You know, you get her actually climbing up tombs and doing a lot more acrobatics and actually doing a lot more sort of tomb raiding um, in this one. Um, it is a huge improvement i really really like it i can't understand why it's not so well remembered or talked about you know it's it's great it's fun it feels more like the games than the first film um in this sort of globe trop, trop uh, globe trotting action adventure um yeah generally first impressions i really really liked it i don't understand as to why i don't remember it or why it's a film that not many people talk about. People always talk about the the first film, but whenever you say, "Oh, have you seen the second one, Cradle of Life?" They go, "No," or "Oh, yeah, but I don't remember it." I'm like, "It's good. It's really good." And I'm I'm generally surprised because, like I said, I in the introduction, I didn't really remember much about it, and I was worried going into it that that meant because I don't remember anything about it, and because other people that I spoke to don't remember anything about it, that it was going to be one of their movies that there's a reason why nobody remembers anything about it because it's not very good, but it's the exact opposite and I'm you can tell in my voice I'm incredibly overjoyed with that notion because I was so worried that it wasn't going to be good but it is and I'm glad you know so yeah first impressions absolutely wonderful um oh, yeah it's, it's just so good so so good um uh, Jared Butler again he is incredible um as Terry Sheard and his character a lot more complex a lot more in depth and actually you get to see a lot more of him than um Daniel Craig he was like the love interest sort of like I male eye candy in the first movie um I'll be honest Jared Butler in my opinion is, is a better actor than Daniel Craig but again that's my opinion shots fired I know uh, <laughs> hot take as they say um but he's more complex, he's deep, he plays a sort of ex-Royal Marines commando turned mercenary. Um, Lara doesn't know if she can trust him or not. And he is like a is a former love interest of 
um, Lara, and he's just so much more interested as a character, and he, he has more stuff to do. Whereas, like, if you remember in in the first movie with Daniel Craig, he was there, but then he wasn't there. Like, he showed up at at the auction, and then you see him helping some guys pull down the the door to the, one of the tombs. Um, and then you just see him, I think, at the end again, holding up the, the counter in his hand, counting on the, the clock, and then the bad guy in the movie shoots him, and then that's basically it, really. You don't actually get a lot of him doing anything that was quote-unquote badass sort of thing. He was just there. Um, but with this one, actually, Jared Butler actually has stuff to do. He, he's important to the story. He's, he's integral to it. Um, and it's just, you know so much better and again he's a better you know Jared Butler's a better actor than Daniel Craig I said it twice now so I mean it um so but yes but I would also like the story that I love about this as well so I'm a big lover of uh, history history is one of my favorite subjects of all time um especially ancient history that's my that's my my key one of my favorites and one of my biggest loves and one thing that's still like, you know, people say like, oh, that's my Roman Empire. I think about it all the time. My Roman Empire is the Library of Alexandria. I think about that all the time. I try not to, to be honest, because it always upsets me when I think about the Library of Alexandria. There's all that history of human history just lost all them uh, worlds and all them sort of stories and tribes and just human history in general. is just lost because of a, a fire. Um so I try not to think about it because it does upset me. Generally, if I had a time machine, that would be the first place I would go. I'd go in and nick as many books as possible just to save it. Um, but I love about this story that it ties into that, that there was another temple, kind of like Alexandria, but it was secret. It, it was no, it wasn't be allowed to put on any maps and you had the, the lunar temple. And in this temple, he kept his most prized possessions. Um and me going in, I thought oh, I was going to be the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be something under those lines. Um, but it turns out it, it's, it deals with Pandora's box and that the cradle of life and that the sort of primordial soup, as you say, or you could be sort of seeding from asteroids, that this place in Africa, um, in Kilimanjaro, is where humanity first step foot and started to spread up upon the globe and humanity as we have today and all that idea and that concept really fascinates me because what i love about this film and what i love about sort of the pandora's box is that it leaves it open to what pandora's box is and why it is you know like you have like the in the way they explain it in the movie everything has an opposite so every action has an equal upper reaction. So where there's yin, there there's lang, yang. Where there's good, there's bad. Where there's human, there is um, sort of anti-human. Where you know where there's life, there is death, sort of thing. Um, and that's sort of the idea: is that this cradle of life, however it came, spurted life, spurted humanity. But at the same place is Pandora's box. It's it's death. Whatever's inside it if ever opened, will cause destruction and would kill uh, sort of humanity. Which then leads into the villain as him being a bioweapons, um, terribly evil person. He, hate, he hates life. He despises life completely. Um, and that he wants to basically sell whatever is in Pandora's box to the highest bidder. They're going to make weapons. They'll destroy the world. And then he'll just create the antidote. And whoever's left, it will give it to the people that he likes, basically, and, and restart humanity again. Um, again, fantastic villain. Actually, I, I, did I write down the villain's name? Let me check my notes. Uh, Jonathan Reese, that was it. Um, by and again, I can't pronounce this guy's name. Sir Sirran Hindis. Um, he plays Jonathan Reese. Really good villain. Probably a lot better than the villain in the, in the first film. Mainly because this villain has a lot more to do than the villain in the first film. Again, he's more integral to the story. But also, it, it interests me because this movie was made on a lot smaller budget than the first film but this film feels a lot more grand, uh, grander a lot more globe trotting it feels like they go more places and do more places when technically they don't because as we looked in the production but most of this movie like is shot in wales so they say they're in china but they're not they're in wales you know what i mean so they did it in such a way where like you unless you knew the behind the scenes you'd think oh god they traveled all over the place this must have a huge budget um so it feels grander on a smaller budget, which is is quite an impressive feat. Um, but yeah, this whole idea with the with the Pandora's box and why is it like it, again? Like it leaves it open. Is it God or some sort of a God? 
Is it aliens? Is it, you know, just the way the universe works, that all planets are seeded and that, you know, where there is life, there is also death. You know, the thing that will create life will also be there, the thing that destroys life, you know, liquid death or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I like that. And it's one of the things I love so much about the Lara Croft games. And again, that in turn, sort of the games like Uncharted um, is because... Let's take Lara Croft, for example, obviously best to be more sort of specific to this, this anyway, is that in the newer games, especially, say, for example, like the first one, the, the new reboot of the Tomb Raider, the idea is they're on an island and there is a storm that means that if you get shipwrecked on this island, you can't leave because this island is surrounded by perpetual storm. Um, and as the story sort of goes on and on and you realize that there's some supernatural sort of uh, thing behind it something that's causing it um and then you find out at the very end that it's not sort of so, so supernatural it's it was a woman who had a gift it was like a bloodline it was kind of like a power and then you had the the second game where you had this guy named joseph and he was like a, a messiah um and it made you think that he was immortal that he was he was a god that he was um an all-powerful person it turns out again spoilers i do apologize it turns out it wasn't it was it was a, a crystal it was a rock that if taken kind of like the sorcerer's stone um if taken gives one person immortality and it's things like that it's like taking the the real world um and making you think it's some supernatural thing but it turns out it's not it's just part of um the planet sort of thing it's just part of of life this one of the secret mysteries the ancient mysteries of the world that was lost the ancient technology that sort of thing um and i love that i, I love the idea of like it's not so supernatural but it doesn't ruin it just because it's it revealed that it isn't supernatural you know um and that's what i love about this is the fact of you see this this orb and then you see pandora's box and they're made out of some sort of weird material it's like is it aliens is it not is it you know, is it a, a god or is it just something else? And it leaves it open for questions because that's the whole point of the mystery. The fun of it is the fact of it could be anything. There's no right or, wrong, right or wrong answer. And I love it. You know, I know a lot of people don't like the third, Indiana, Indiana, not the third, the fourth Indiana Jones movie because they went to aliens. Like apparently Pandora's box, I mean, not Pandora's box, the um, Ark of the Covenant and then somebody pulling somebody's some guy's heart out and the guy's still being alive. That's all completely fine. But as soon as you throw in aliens, people go, whoa, too far. Um, I've never understood that, to be honest. Um, and I'll get onto that when I eventually review Indiana Jones. But the point is I'm trying to make is the fact of if it is aliens, awesome, because you've got the whole shadow monsters. What are the shadow monsters? Why do they exist? What are they? Where do they come from? You know, was it like an asteroid that hit and these creatures came from this asteroid, but so did we, you know, and they, they are basically us or they are sort of the remnants of Pandora's box when it op when it was first opened and like they are just there to protect it. Again, many questions, no answers, but I don't need an answer because that's the fun of it. That's the mystery behind it. I don't need an answer to it, you know. Um, And yeah. I, I just really, really loved and enjoyed this movie. And I just don't understand why people aren't talking about it or why it's a film that's not as remembered as much as the first one. I really don't understand. Um, like moving on to my, like my final thoughts, I really do like it. And I definitely would want to see a third movie with an old, older Lara Croft. I said it in um, my review of the first movie that I would love to see Angelina Jolie come back as a older Lara for one last adventure um, for a third film and I'm 100% more sure about that now in this um, that I feel like seeing Angelina Jolie what she's done since and what she's done recently she still got it she still looks incredible um, she has still got sort of the sort of ability the movability she is just incredible actress that I think that we deserve to have one more go at Lara, like one final movie um, with an older Lara, because we've never really seen that. We always see Lara when she's a teenager or she's sort of in her 20s, 30s. You know, we never see an older, mature Lara. We always see a young Lara. I would like to see um, an older sort of Lara kick ass and have one final sort of uh, adventure, you know, 
and it could be like they do with Indiana Jones because she's not going to retirement. She's just slowed down a bit. She's enjoying. She's done all the mysteries. She's solved all the things she wants to solve. Um, she's taking a sort of an easier life in sort of the Buckinghamshire countryside. And then one last sort of mystery comes along to her table. I don't know what it is or what it could be, but one last thing comes out. It picks her interest and she, and she gets the two guns out and she's going, one more go. You know, that would be epic for me. But also, like, I was watching the new Mission Impossible yesterday and I love Hayley Atwell. I think she's absolutely incredible. I have a huge crush on Hayley Atwell. I've loved her since I first saw her in um, Captain America First Avenger um, when she played Peggy Carter. And I'd love to see her come back as Captain Britain, to be honest, but that's a completely different subject. But the reason I bring her up is the fact that I feel like Hayley Atwell could be a really awesome uh, Lara Croft as well. Hayley Atwell, she's not she's not old at all. Let's let's Google Hayley Atwell for quickly. Let's see. Hayley, Hayley Atwell. Hayley Atwell, she is 42 years old. And Angelina Jolie, Angelina Jolie is 48. You know, so she, so Angelina Jones is a bit older than Hayley Atwell, but if they, basically the reason I bring it up is the fact of if they asked Angelina and Angelina said, no, I don't want to do a third movie or I don't want to do um, another film as Lara Croft, but they wanted to do it an older, mature um, Hayley, uh, uh, Lara Croft, I thought Hayley Atwell would be a good fit for that. You know, um, because she has the accent, she has the look, she um, she's badass in, in films. If you've seen her in, in any of her movies, she's pretty badass and she can knows how to handle a weapon, you know. So, yeah, I feel like if if Angelina Jolie didn't want to come back for a third film, but they wanted to do an older Lara, Hayley Atwell would be the perfect choice for that. Not that I'm saying Hayley, At- Hayley Atwell's old or Angelina Jolie, uh, th- to be honest with you, um, as sort of medical science gets better and as humans are living longer you'll actually find that like back when i was younger and years and years ago 40 to 50 to 60 was considered old nowadays actually you'll find that 40 50 and 40 50 60 is actually considered quite young um and it and it's going to be like that as the years go on as people start living longer and um, being healthier for longer because obviously you know medical science and we now know what's good for us and what's not good for us and that sort of thing um so yeah i would still say Hayley Atwell is still quite young and so is angelina jolie at 48 but i feel like they they both would be a pan a fantastic um consideration for an older lara um a, a mature lara if they, if Paramount would do it, or whoever owns the sort of um, Lara Croft license, uh, movie license today, that's sort of that's a question up in the air. But even so, I would just love to see another go around with Lara Croft as for um, Joe Lee. I feel like she would do a fantastic job, and I've, I, I, I generally think I don't know Angelina sadly, but I generally think she would come back and do it. I just have a feeling you just think about seeing knowing her as an actress and seeing all the movies she's done i feel like if if the script was good enough i feel like she'd come back for one more ride but i don't know maybe i'm pulling at strings well maybe i'm just trying to be a bit hopeful but yeah i generally really love this movie um and yeah i think it's better than the first one i think both films are great to be honest it's just I don't know. Maybe this movie didn't do very well in terms of uh, the box office and maybe it didn't make as much money back and that's why they didn't decide to do another one. Or maybe it was, like I said, in the production. Maybe it was the fact of the director didn't have a very good time with it and I don't know, maybe they were like, well, this guy doesn't want to come back and the movie didn't do very well. Like, There's many things up in the air. Um, let's actually have a look at that, actually. Let's have a look. Let's Google Lara Croft. Let's go to here. Boo-da-ba-da-ba. The box office. The film debuted in fourth place behind Bad Boys 2, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of Black Pearl, and Spy Kids 3D Game Over, with a take of 21.8 million in the United Kingdom. The film opened at number three behind American Wedding and Pirates of the Caribbean, earning $1.5 million in its first three days. The film finished with a domestic gross of $65.6 million and a worldwide of $160.1 million. Dollars, which actually, considering that this movie was made for ninety-five million, um, it made 
a decent amount of money. Now, nowadays, if I'm being honest, if a movie nowadays was made for 95 million and it only made 100 and 160.1 million dollars back, it would be considered a financial flop. But we're talking about the early 2000s. This is before streaming, right? So movies could afford to not do very well at the box office because you'd always make your money back on um, di- on physical. People would go out, buy the DVDs, um, that sort of thing. Um, so you'd always make your money back on DVD sales. So a lot less movies flopped back in the day than they do nowadays, mainly because of streaming and things like that and blah, 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 blah and all that BS. But the point is I'm trying to make is the fact of it made back a decent amount of money. So I'm surprised while it never decided to make a sequel. Uh, the Cradle of Life was considered more successful at the international box office, but was a domestic box office failure. It also faced competition with Finding Nemo, a record-breaking animation film. Paramount blamed the failure of the film on the poor performance of the then latest installment of the video game series, the, uh, Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness. I've never played it, but I've heard a lot of bad things about it. Um, after numerous delays, Angel of Darkness was rushed to shelves just over a month before the release of the film. Despite the final pro- product being unfinished and loaded with bugs, it spawned Metacritic sales and mixed reviews from critics. Founder Edris Interactive senior executive Jeremy Heath Smith, who was also credited as an excessive producer in the film, re resigned days after the game was released. IGM wrote the film's lower box office haul was enough to cut this franchise short. Well, that's not very fair that the reason that the game didn't do very well is why the movie didn't do very well. Like it did well internationally, which means there's interest around the world for another movie, but they just go, well, no, it didn't make enough because the game was crap. Like, what if the game didn't come out? What would you have said then? Would you have said, oh, the movie was still was was a failure because of Finding Nemo? Like, no. Um, no, it's like, I don't know. Some oh, people are stupid. Executives are stupid. They they don't know what they're talking about most of the time. They bloody shelved Coyote versus Acme. So what? They obviously don't know what they're talking about. Um, but again, that's a topic for another day. Um, according to re- uh, review um, aggregator Metacritic, Lara Croft Tomb Raider: The Cradle of Life received mixed or average reviews based on an average score of forty three out of a hundred from thirty not thirty four critic reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. The film has a score of 24% based on 176 reviews with an average rating of 4.6 out of 10. The website Critical Consensus reads, though the sequel is an improvement over the first movie, it's still lacking in frills. Well, that's a lie. Um, Audience polled by uh, CinemaScore gave it a grade of B- on a scale of A to F. Um, Critics continue to praise Joe Lee as Lara Croft and Yudo Hare of... Um, Salon described it as a highly enjoyable summer thrill ride, praised Joe Lee and thought it was better than its predecessor, which it was. Robert Ebert gave the film three out of four stars, stating that the film was better than the first one, more um, assured, more entertaining. It uses imagination and exciting locations to give the movie the same kind of pulp adventure feeling we get from the Indiana Jones movies which I completely agree. But to say that the movie is lacking in frills um, and it is average is a complete lie. But again, these are reviews from like 2003, so I'm not going to get myself worked up over them, but I completely disagree. And maybe this is one of them films that just gets better with age, that at the time they just couldn't... It, it just wasn't one of those movies at first that really um, caught people's attention. And that after years and years and years, after the dust has settled, people are coming, will come back to it and go, actually, I was uh, unfair to this film. Because it happens a lot. And I feel like this is one of those where it was unfairly judged and it's actually a lot better than um, what it's given credit for. Um, it also says here that grossing... So this movie grossed uh, $160.1 million compared to its predecessor, which made $275 million. But the... Um, last movie was made for a lot more money than this one so i'd still say this movie was a lot better in terms of making money than probably the first one was but even so back in the early 2000s if your movie made um 275 million dollars that was still a win you know um but yeah 
so I just wanted I just wanted to de- delve deep into that to sort of understand as to why this movie's not really widely remembered. And it turns out it's due to the game didn't do very well, which I feel like is it's pathetic excuse by the studio. But you know, here we go. Anyway, trivia time before we finish. So I've got some interesting trivia. So remember in the introduction where I tried to find that article about um, the whole sort of breast size and how that Angelina Jolie said that she wanted to, in the second movie, to basically have her her natural body and not to pad out Lara? Well, I found it. So in Lara Croft Tomb Raider 2001, Angelina Jolie had to wear bra padding in order for her breast size to measure up to the video game character. Jolie wears considerably less and possibly no padding in this film as the decision was made to give Lara more reali- realistic dimensions. I see, I knew I wasn't lying. I knew that was something that, I, that was true that I read, right? But yeah, so basically, as I mentioned, she wanted a, a Lara that was more sort of realistic and more sort of akin to what an, an actual woman looks like, you know? And she does. And to be honest, Lara and Angelia Jolie, she looked incredible in the first movie and she looks absolutely incredible in this one, you know. Um, so it just proves that that unrealistic padding and all the extra stuff they put onto her wasn't needed. Really, really wasn't needed. Um, but again, it's the early 2000s. I'm not defending it, but that's just the way people's minds were at the time. Um Another bit of trivia, in the scene where Lara Croft and Cherry Sheridan jump off a building wearing flying suits called wingsuits, the stunt was performed by two men who developed the suits. No CGI, wires, nets or other special effects were involved. The modern wingsuit was invented by Patrick de Gaudron, who died in a parachute accident in April 1998 while testing a new type of parachute in Hawaii. Because I I remember seeing that scene for the first time and actually being amazed um, by it and it does kind of look like cg at times but if you actually pay attention to it it's like it's not cg it's like generally that was a actual wingsuit um which is incredible um the film was banned in china because it damaged china's reputation giving the impression of a country in chaos with no government and overrun by secret societies <laughs> i have to laugh there because for what we know of china now that's really spot on. I was like, yeah, I can see why it would be banned in China. Um, and that's probably what, the reason why a lot of it isn't filmed in China is because the Chinese government probably saw what the story was going to be about and decided, no, we're not, we're not going to film here. You know. Um, and at one point in the movie, Lara Croft attacks a big, uh, big guy using very sophisticated movements with an antique rifle. Her movements are taken from the Queen and salute used by the U.S. Army drill team. And um, that's really, really cool. She actually defeats a guy by, by doing uh, the routine that you would do if you was in the army with a rifle and with the bayonet. It's one. It's a really, really good scene. Um, Wow, what other bit of trivia do I have here that's interesting? Um, just as in the first film, there were several scenes in which the live-action Lara mimics the computer game versions. In particular, a scene in which she climbs around a pagoda and pole vaults to a helicopter. She also takes a nasty fall, as the animated Lara was prone to do. Um, the... The skin on Lara's upper left arm is rarely seen exposed in this film. Angelina Jolie sports a large tattoo on her upper left bicep, which required makeup to cover up. The fact her left arm is rarely bare in this film, her opening scene in a bikini is shot in which away her right arm, not her left, dominates. Um, maybe due to the criticism that the tattoo was sometimes poorly um, concealed in Lara Croft, the Tomb Raider, the first movie. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that is all of the trivia I have for you today um yeah as i said i absolutely love this movie i really really do i don't understand why it's no like i understand why at the time um it was so widely sort of not remembered or thought about and sort of glossed over but i feel like that just gives people more reason nowadays to go back and give it a go if you've only seen the first lara croft movie and you haven't seen the sequel i highly recommend it if you live in the uk and you have uh, the B- the BBC iPlayer app. It's free on there. Both movies are free to watch there. That's how I watch this film on the BBC iPlayer app. Um, and the rest of the world, I'm sure it's on other streaming platforms. The rest of the world, or then again, you could probably find it for really, really cheap on DVD if you wanted to go that far or to rent it online. It's probably really cheap. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it, especially if you enjoyed the first movie. Give it a second chance. If you have seen it and you don't remember it like I did, again, give it a go. You might be surprised. I was surprised that I I liked it so much. And yeah, it's going to be one of those movies that I recommend from now on. Of like, if you like Lara Croft, 
watch the first one and definitely watch the second one because you have a lot of fun. It's a good few hours, uh, you know, to waste watching Lara Croft be badass, to glow trot, to be the Tomb Raider. Um, yeah. I'm just really, really excited that I like this movie so much. Um, the next movie that I'm going to be watching is the Alicia Vikander um, movie that came out in 2018, I think it was, just called Tomb Raider, based off the Tomb Raider games. So that'll be the next Lara Croft movie that I look into. But until then, um, it's been an absolute pleasure. You've been listening to the Nerd Stage podcast. I've been your host, Luke the Human, and I'll catch you in the next one. And don't forget, to like comment and subscribe if you listen on youtube and if you if you listen on spotify drop me a rating it helps me out greatly all right that's it for today bye bye <laughs>